so I come from the University of Cambridge. I am actually joined between um, the Department of Material Science and the Department of Earth Sciences, despite not knowing any geology whatsoever. But that is because um, these two departments have a very strong history of what I would call solid state physics, okay? And, and they were looking uh, in 2017 for someone uh, that was gonna be an assistant professor in multi-scale, multi-dimensional imaging of natural and synthetic material. And somehow with my optical spectroscopy and electron microscopy background, I convinced them to hire me. And, um, and here I am, okay? So, so five, five, year, five years later, I'm a, I'm a professor now, and, and my title has slightly changed, and now it, they, they made it shorter. So it's just Professor of Synthetic and Natural Nanomaterials because they wouldn't let me keep that, that large, long title uh, anymore. Uh, but anyways, uh, it's, been, it's been nearly five years. Uh, my group has grown to what I like to call a, a steady state. We have a number of collaborators and uh, I've integrated with the, the, the UK and the Europe uh, funding system. And, and what I'm gonna tell you about today is, is a bit of a mishmash of, of different things we've been working on. And uh, it's gonna be really quite different than some of the talks you talked about, you, you heard today because I'm an actual experimentalist. I make samples, okay? And, uh, and that might be a bit different than, uh, than people who think a lot about, about data. And, and so I think there's a, there's a lot of synergy here. And if you'd like to, to, to talk further about how you can analyze my data, I'd be really keen, <laughs> okay? Um, all right, but, but basically, um, we are gonna talk um, a little bit about, about plasmonic, what's a plasmonic, very briefly to sort of motivate uh, a lot of the work that I do. We're gonna talk about uh, some, uh, so, so some of these uh, magnesium structures. We're then gonna talk about uh, a bit of crystallography and how do we understand the shape of these structures and then a few of our, our own toy projects on, uh, on nanoparticle shape, that's all really quite new. Uh, we're gonna swing back to plasmonics and look at some stem eels data and some of that analysis. Uh, we're gonna be thinking then, ah, well, these materials are actually optically active, so let's look at some uh, optical microscopy. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, our systems in there. Uh, and then we're gonna move on to understanding their shapes uh, and understanding also other things that depend on shape, and I'm going to finish by talking about the work of uh, one of my uh, one of my students, who is co-supervised with Paul Migley, uh, working on on vectorial uh, tomography for uh, for magnetic systems. All right, so um, the bread and butter really of my work is to look at, at these oscillations. And, and this is a localized surface plasmon resonance, and it occurs in a small metallic particle. Imagine you have this cloud of electron, you send in an electric field, and at a certain frequency, you're basically just gonna get a resonance. Uh, LSPR, okay? Uh, that basically leads to wavelength-dependent absorption and scattering of light, so that leads to color. Okay, these particles have a color. Uh, it also leads to enhancement of the electric field at the surface of the particles as the electrons slush around. And, and that basically leads to um, uh, surface enhanced sensing like surface enhanced Raman spectroscopies and these, these kind of, of, of properties. And sort of more recently, people have become really interested in them in that once you excite this resonance, well, it, it's gonna decay. And, and it can decay in a variety of ways, either by creating heat or creating sort of non-thermally equilibrated electron. And you basically think, aha, well, you can, you, you can either kill cancer cells or drive chemical reactions and so on and so forth. I, I, basically using these particles as antenna for light uh, to then localize that energy of light at their, at their surface. All right, so um, what I've been doing at, in Cambridge for the past sort of four years is say, well, look, people, you don't have to just work with gold and silver, and magnesium is a great plasmonic as well. And so for those of you who have taken a little bit of physics, all the optical properties of a material, or basically all the properties, uh, uh, are kind of cooked in this dielectric function. Okay, so here I have the real part and the imaginary part of the dielectric function for a bunch of materials that, that would be plasmonic, and what you look for to have a resonance is basically to be a good resonator, so have low losses, and, and to be polarizable, so have a, a relatively large 
uh, negative real part of the dielectric function, okay? And, um, and, and you can sort of massage these into either this sort of the simple figure of merit that Blaber developed about 10 years ago, or actually the, the oscillation, the resonance quality factor, which is really the, the correct uh, quality factor to look at that. But it doesn't matter. It tells you the same, the same thing. So let's look at, at this sort of quality factor here. So the first thing you learn is that this gray metal here is the best plasmonic by about an order of magnitude, and that's silver. Okay, um, but, but silver has issues. Uh, it, it decays, it also reacts with sulfur, and so for chemical reaction, it tends to be a bit of a problem. Uh, and then you have the, the blue and, and sort of, uh, the, sorry, the, I don't know my colors, violet and green, and that's um, sodium and potassium. Some issues there too. Okay, and, and, then, and then sort of uh, uh, gold, copper, and, and here, quite down here, right, it is magnesium, but, but what you notice is that uh, magnesium is actually significantly better than aluminum at essentially all wavelengths, and especially at the wavelength of, um, of sunlight. So, so we're interested in magnesium, um, not just because it's a good plasmonic, but obviously because it's widely abundant, uh, which means it's really cheap, but it's also truly biocompatible. Right? You need magnesium to, to survive, and, and it is hence processable in your body. So, so we've been basically making magnesium, okay? My group does synthesis now. I have zero background in synthesis, but hiring the right people uh, and, and sort of thinking about the problem hard enough, uh, we managed to do that. Uh, this is a relatively simple uh, synthesis. Okay, I'm not going to bore you with the detail, but, but you're basically just creating a reducing agent by popping an electron on an electron carrier and then giving that electron to, to a magnesium organometallic precursor, which then form magnesium zero metallic, which then sort of nucleates and grows into metallic magnesium nanoparticles. And here are some, some of our samples, right? So different sizes, uh, uh, different shapes uh, of, of these, which have obviously different optical properties. And so these, these particles are sort of faceted uh, crystalline structures. Uh, of course, the first question you, you might have, okay, even before thinking about microscopy or anything is, doesn't that blow up in your face? And, and uh, obviously you might <laughs> think of that, uh, given, given magnesium really, really, really wants to get rid of its electrons. Uh, but the reality is, in fact, that it, it creates an essentially protective oxide layer. Um, and you know, we, we have to <laughs> prove that every time we submit a paper and prove it again and again every time we submit a paper. You imagine the reviewer's comments on, on, on oxide layer formation. And hence, we have tons and tons of data, and I really, really don't want to spend too much time uh, on, on this data, but, you know, we can do TEM, okay, and we can look at, at the oxide layer, and it's, it's sort of, you know, it has bits of cubic MgO in, okay? Um, pr pr pretty, pretty simple stuff, um, sort of maybe less than five, but more like 10 nanometer. Uh, we can, you know, obviously um, map these, um, the, the elemental distribution, right, with either DDS or, or eels, and, and sort of line scan our way through an approximate, you know, you know oxide layer of maybe 10 nanometer. Um, but one of, one of the fun things that I, I'll come back to really a bit later is that magnesium has this, this very, very, very prominent bulk plasmon, which is rare in most metals. Most metals are very, very damped. Uh, and, and so we can see a peak at 10.6, and we can literally immediately map where the metal is and convince ourselves that these particles are, are actually uh, metallic, okay? And, and obviously, we, uh, we look at their stability. We can heat them up in air. Nothing happens until about 400 degrees. So, you know, uh, pretty stable. We can leave them uh, to dry on the bench and, you know, a week or two later, come back and, uh, and there's still metallic magnesium. Okay, so, so I hope I convince you that, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not making um, uh, bombs here. Just don't mix them with water, okay? Because <laughs> then, then the hydroxide takes over and the hydroxide is actually soluble and, and, and so on. Right. Okay, so, 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 so we, we're making magnesium, we're interested in it because we think it's a great platform to do a number of plasmonic uh, applications. But as we were sort of doing that, and this is really just since I, since I moved to Cambridge, we've been uh, asking ourselves what are the, the shapes that are made by magnesium. And if you sort of scratch your head back um, um, to, to sort of the understanding of shape, um, to, you know, all the way to 1901, to Wolf, 
um, you can find that basically the shape of a crystal, whether it's a nanoscale crystal or a large macroscopic crystal, is basically dictated by, first of all, its crystal structure, which dictate the different relative orientations of the plane. Uh, then the twinning, which, which dictate how many crystal lights are basically stuck together. And finally, by the surface energy or you know, growth velocity, which is our, our way of saying sort of a, a kinetic growth um, uh, uh, of the, the relative uh, crystal facet. And, and so in the, in the FCC uh, uh, structures, OK, so if, if you're or in a cubic structure, if the facets 1, 0, 0 has low energy, you get a cube. If the facets 1, 1, 1 has low energy, you get an octahedron. OK, we're all, well, I said we're all pretty familiar with that. And I'm not sure. Some of us are pretty familiar with that, OK? Um, and, and, and then you can sort of um, uh, work your way through the, through the different uh, models. And, and, and basically, what you're saying is just a two dimensional projection model is that, that either the surface energy in a thermodynamic way, or the, the surface growth velocity um, will then be, well, the, the, the amount of that, uh, that, the length of that vector will be proportional to this. And so the longer the vector, the less the facet will be expressed. And you can, you can basically build a model by putting a, a twin plane as well and reflecting along this twin plane and doing this, this, this same kind of thing. And, and in the FCC system, what you get or either sort of singly twin structures or, or five-fold twin structure. We know that, that, that FCC, for instance, folds along the 111. And, and we've worked a lot on this. Uh, we actually have a graphical user interface. This is from what, what seems like a million years ago from 2019. Uh, and, um, and, and you just sort of input your parameter and get, get a nice shape. Um, I'm not going to say too much more about this, this graphical user interface, except that it's not really to make, make funny shapes. It's actually to export this funny shape as an array of dipole onto which then you can do simulations. That, that's really why we build this. Um, and so we, uh, we know very well what, what's, what's in, in, in FCC, but, but really we started being interested in, in magnesium and into all sorts of other compositions. And, um, and it turns out the world is not just FCC. There's only maybe a, a quarter of the elements that crystallize in FCC, and hexagonal cubic and body center cubic are uh, really quite important. So, so magnesium is, unlike basically every plasmonic material, is, is, is a hexagonal closed pack material. It's not FCC. And so the single crystals are basically these, um, the, the, these hexagonal pyramids okay, with, the, with the basal closed pack plane expressed predominantly on, on, on these facets. Well, that's easy enough to understand. Uh, but, then, but then as we looked at our, our reaction mixtures, uh, we, saw, we saw a variety of different shapes that we really did not understand. And it's clear that this is a twin shape, right? And then so we started investigating, okay, well, if we, if we start tilting this, like what, what does it actually look like? Well, it's, it's kind of a folded shape. And in an SEM, it gives you a bit of a 3D uh, view. We, we did a whole bunch of tomographic reconstruction. It's a bit messy because there's an oxide layer. It's not the same density. So it leads to, to these sort of pretty, pretty wobbly uh, facet. But you can still see the, the sort of the, the, the folding angle uh, going on here. Um, and it turns out, you know, twinning in hexagonal closed pack nanostructures was not known up to this point. No one knew which planes they would twin on or what structure they, they would get. And so we sort of talked back about the actual crystallography and looked at the, at the, at the densely packed plane that could potentially be, uh, be twins and indeed can be twin in, in the bulk. And um, this is a lot more complicated than in FCC because HCP has one, two, four, seven planes that can lead to twinning, okay? So I'm showing four here, but there's, there's three more of this type. There's a one, one, two bar, one, 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 two bar, two, one, one, two bar, three, and the one, one, two bar, four as well. And these can all be twin planes because they are quite densely packed. Uh, so we uh, basically uh, changed our model. It's now got a whole lot more buttons. And, and, and now we can sort of think what can these look like? Um, and and we, w we did that hand in hand with sort of between the theorists and the experimentalists uh, in my group and actually uh, found these kind of shapes um, uh, that, we, that we predicted. So these are, these are twinning along the, the lowest energy twin plane and, and this sort of goes uh, on and on. And we thought about names for them, okay. And, 
And then this one we've been calling the tent for a while, but then we talked this one, well, you know, what goes next to a tent? Well, a chair, and then what do you do when you sit in a chair in your tent? You eat tacos, and maybe you fly a kite. And so this paper in my group is called the picnic paper, okay? Uh, and so uh, we actually see these particles, okay? They're, these are really remarkable shapes, but, but they do exist, okay? So here's a, a, a few examples of them from, from SEM images, so it's just easier to see. Uh, here's a large-scale SEM image where you can see a little bit of, of each of the shape, and, and here's basically their, their uh, predominance. And, and obviously, there, there's basically more uh, single crystals, and then their, um, uh, their, their predominance goes as the twin energy, so the, twin, the lowest energy twin plane happens more often. Okay, fair, fair. fair enough, and then we can, we can play all sorts of games and, and think, okay, well, what if we have a bit of kinetic in there? We can, we can fill them, and we've done all sorts of, of, of sort of numerical uh, investigation of, uh, of these, but I don't want to get uh, too, much, too much into that. Um, but, but sort of thinking back about sort of today's uh, uh, talk uh, about, about machine learning, this is sort of one of our next, um, our next step. You know, when, you look, when you look at images like this, uh, it's really a where's Waldo of shapes, right? Like my students spend incredible amount of time, well, used to spend incredible amount of time, sort of just saying, aha, well, here's a tent, let me measure it. Here's, here's, a, here's a rod, let me measure it. Here's a, you know, and this, this is just like a, an absolute um, uh, waste of time. And so we've been thinking you know, quite a bit about, about machine learning opportunities. And I wanted to highlight this because this just got accepted literally this morning. Um, and uh, sort of the machine learning in plasmonics, and, it, and it's much grander than, than just in, in electron microscopy. There's just in electron microscopy, it's just this, this sort of diagram, but we've been thinking about, uh, about a number of ways we can apply that. But, but in this case, really, we are interested in developing basically an image recognition tool. This is what machine learning is very good at, indeed. Uh, actually, not just to recognize the size of spheres in the TEM image, but actually recognize the shape of our structure as well as their size um, sort of automatically. So we're, uh, we're working towards that now. All right, going back to our periodic table, um, you know, we were, while we were working on this, obviously COVID hit and we were all home and we're like, aha, well, what, what kind of project can we do now? <clears throat> and, and one of the projects we decided to do is, is look back at the periodic table and ask ourselves, well, we figured out twinning um, for HCP, twinning for FCC is well known. What about BCC? Okay. Um, I don't know if you believe me, but BCC twin nanoparticles are either rare or inexistent. Um, that's actually a true statement. I am going to claim inexistent, but you know, I don't want to put that in writing because someone might, might come up and say, aha, actually. Um, but as far as I know, they are never been reported. Is, is that reasonable? Right? There's twinning everywhere in the world. There's twinning in all sorts of nanoparticle system. And we've been, been really scratching our heads on, on, on that. Okay, so, so we decided to say, okay, imagine we twin. And if you twin here, you're going to twin about along the 101 plane of BCC. This is the low index plane. This is what twins in the bulk. Okay? Uh, so, so we started having this thought experiment. So we, we took um, uh, surface energy, well, known surface energy, and, and reproduce known single crystal shapes, and then ask ourselves, well, given these surface energy, what kind of twin shapes would we get, and how would we determine that they exist? All right, so here's an example. Okay, so this is, this is with the surface energy of, of iron metal, molybdenum, uh, and another iron um, uh, metal, and basically a different synthetic condition. Um, okay, well, uh, you know, there, there's two different renderings there, by the way, right? So, so there's one on top here, one on the bottom. The bottom is, is just kind of more rounded to give you a bit, bit of a better feel. Um, you look at those, you're like, well, maybe they're not that different. Hard to say. Okay, well, what, what kind of, of electron microscopy solution do we have to determine shape? Well, the first thing you do, you do HADAF, right? We can simulate a HADAF. It's just a, production, a projection of the thickness. Imagine you have th this guy here. You can, you can simulate your HADAF, take a line scan through your HADAF, it looks like that. If it was twin, simulate your HADAF, take a line scan, it looks like that. Can you tell experimentally? No. It'd be a little bit rounded, right? You, you're not gonna tell. All right, electron diffraction. Now, that's my friend, right? Um, okay, so I take an electron diffraction pattern from to the entirety of this single crystal particle. This is what I get. I take a diffraction pattern from the entirety of a single particle that this is what I get. Well, okay, you can say, well, these are a bit, bit more intense. Maybe, but is that really diagnostic? 
And then we sort of quickly realize that a lot of the low index electron diffraction patterns would not be diagnostic in the case of a twin body-centered cubic nanoparticle. So, so, so really, um, they're, they're just hard to see and hard to diagnose. And, and we made a whole map, okay? So this is a map of is it distinguishable or not according to the, uh, the crystallographic uh, um, uh, direction. So in, in orange is indistinguishable. In, in, in blue is distinguishable. You might notice that there's not a whole lot of low index direction. There's basically some of the 110 type um, uh, family that are distinguishable. Uh, so, 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 so really, um, th that's a bit of a problem. Here's a, a, a few of the examples, okay? The, these are distinguishable, so their diffraction patterns have extra spots. If you did uh, HR uh, EM or HR STEM, right, uh, you would actually see lines of atom look different on each side of your twin plane, whether if you're, if you're not distinguishable, this is the, the kind of stuff uh, you're looking at. And so, so, so really, the bottom line, and if you only had HREM, obviously, you're, all, you're lost, okay? Uh, the, 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 the bottom line is um, we, we think BCC single uh, um, 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 twins might actually occur, and people have just not been able to look for them and have not looked for them properly. And so um, we, we've been trying to get our hands on some BCC crystal, uh, not successfully so far, but... Um, Hey, if you you know if you know people making them, uh, we, we we are really quite quite interested. Um, we then got a um, a senior um, a, a senior student, basically a master's student, and we wanted an extra project for her, and and we said, aha, well let, let's go back to our periodic table, and and now let's look at, at our body-centered tetragonal structures, right? Can can we play the same game with body-centered tetragonal? Obviously you can, and here is a few examples, right? So. So this is indium. Indium is basically a distorted FCC structure. And this is beta tin, which is basically a distorted diamond cubic structure. Uh, but, but they basically crystallize as tragonal because of that distortion. And, um, and uh, these twin along the, the 101. OK, we know that. Uh, and, and, and we can do, we can basically play the, the, the same game. Uh, although now, because they're, uh, they're tetragonal, well, you can make this, this wolf nut either as normals or directions. Uh, but, uh, but hey, let, let's look at the normals, which basically would, uh, would be relevant if the particle was sitting on the substrate along one of the, the facet normal. And, and here there's a whole lot more diagnostic points, okay? Uh, so, so these structures actually um, are, um, are, are likely to be, to, to, to be easily observable. And indeed, um, uh, plenty of them have been observed. In fact, uh, indium uh, does five-fold twinning, again, because it's basically a distorted FCC lattice. And in the five-fold twin, every, every single diffraction pattern is, um, is actually diagnostic. Uh, if you take a diffraction pattern of something that has five crystallite, I hope there are extra spots in there that tell you it's not a single crystal. And indeed it does. Okay, so that, that was one of our, our fun projects. I want to swing back now uh, to, uh, to some of our plasmonic work. Now that we understand the, the shape of these structures, we then were asking ourselves, well, how, how does the shape affect um, the electric field localization? So the near field really um, uh, in, in these structures. And obviously we do that with, uh, with TEM, okay, but really we do that with with low loss eels, we use monochromated instruments. Uh, we go to a bunch of places to do that. Uh, most recently, we've gone to, um, uh, to SuperStam with Quentin Ramas uh, and, and his neon, which works really, really wonderfully. OK, you know, you all know this, obviously, uh, the eels probability and so on. I'm not, not going to uh, spend too much time on that. OK, so, so basically, in, in our case, we look really at the low loss, OK, sort of 0 to sort of 15 EV. Um, and and if, you, if you're away from a nanoparticle, you're seeing the tail of the zero loss peak. If you're near a nanoparticle, you see some wobbles. Okay, and, and the game is, is to fit the wobbles. And that's basically just it. Okay, uh, and, and we've been fitting a lot of wobbles, and, and this is work that I've done at Rice uh, before, before I left. Um, and now I guess my, uh, my successor at Rice is going to be talking uh, tomorrow, presumably not about STEM eels, but um, about, about stuff done on the same microscope. Um, um, and this is all not on magnesium. Uh, so so as when I moved to Cambridge, we got interested in, in magnesium. And these are the kind, the kind of wobbles. So again, right, so we have this, this amazing sort of peak of, of magnesium metal that tells us exactly where the metal is. And, and then we have all these plasmon modes 
and this is just a, you know, a three-dimensional data cube that we need to extract the modes of. And hey, you know, a, a, a lot in the past, what we had done, at least when I was in Cambridge, is this business of non-negative matrix factorization, right? It's just basically PCA, glorified PCA, okay? And, and, and if you do that on these structures, or at least in, in the hexagon, this is a giant, giant failure, uh, because what you end up with is something unphysical, because you have to relearn physics, Okay, and, and, and what you end up in, I just want to point your attention to the blue mode here. Uh, so you basically have a, ha, have a machine learning, okay, algorithm, <laughs> let's not get too excited by that, um, that, um, that, uh, that gets modes that have two peaks. And obviously we know this is, this is, this is unrealistic, okay? So here's an example of where, you know, if you're gonna fit modes of any type, you should just find a way to actually put um, shapes uh, that we know from physics. So, you know, scrap that. Uh, you could obviously do sort of basically FTEM, right? Look at, at, at sort of slices. Um, this is actually a giant failure when modes overlap. Uh, and you really need to know what the answer is before you, you tackle the problem. So this is just not working. And so, you know, we do something very dumb, uh, which is basically a global Gaussian fitting, okay? Um, but, you know, it, it, does, it does work beautifully, and I would hope that, uh, that we could do something less dumb. Uh, in the future, okay? Um, but, but, but basically you can fit, uh, fit each, of, each of your peak, uh, fit that width, the position, blah, 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 and, and, and then sort of extract where you get that loss probability in, in your map, and you see so, something like this, okay? This is old data by now, but, but a number of modes. This is, this is a donut mode, okay? A, 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 you know, a tip mode and an edge mode, and if you're an experimentalist like me, well, you call this a donut mode forever, but if you have access to excellent theories, it's you well, Emily, this is this is what it should look like, and it's a dipole. Okay, <laughs> very simple uh, dipole resonance. Uh, the, the second mode is actually two two modes, sort of uh, uh, on top of each other. They're, they're they're not they're not really strictly degenerate, um, but they have such close energy, and these modes are so broad that actually you can't like untangle them. Uh, you can on different size particles at some point. And then you get this, okay, we've, we've not done that just for one particle, we've done this for, 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 for many of them, and then really start, can start to extract relationships. And, and what we're really after, right, is how does this change with size and shape, and, and, and how we want to know what, how it changed um, with, with size is, is basically this slope, right? So this is, this is my plasma energy as a function of size, and, and we're just interested in how much we can tweak that, that plasma energy, how much we can tweak each mode, really, uh, with size, and the answer is, well, quite a bit, and, and you can get resonance sort of all the way from sort of 1.4 EV to sort of 3.6, 3.7, so really broad, um, broad uh, range of resonances, and, um, you know, and, and that made us pretty happy, okay? Um, and, uh, but, but, um, but in reality, of course, they're, they're not all hexagons, and so we became interested in, in the modes in, um, in, in the, the lower symmetry uh, um, shape. So this is, this is a tent, right? It's twin, but it really is just a, a, a folded hexagon that's a little bit longer. So, so you're, just, you're just, just breaking the symmetry. You still have a dipole, uh, but it now basically breaks uh, into two. You still have quadrupole-like modes and so on, but you really can't call them quadrupole at some point. And so we developed this basically uh, this node sort of notation, right? So how many nodes along which directions uh, uh, you're getting. And, and, and again, we can, we can call up the theorists to do, to do, to do calculations and, um, and, and match that with, with our experimental data. We have obviously um, lots and lots and lots of, of experimental data on, on various shapes, okay? Just, you know, slides and slides and slides of that. But, um, but, but, but basically this works, okay? And, and we have some, some long rods as well that start to display uh, many, many, many nodes along the, the longitudinal direction and no more nodes along the transverse, just, just like you see for gold and silver rods and just like people have seen for gold and silver rods 30 years ago, right? Um, and obviously, this is, the physics is there, right? I, I, this is just telling you that basically the frequency of a resonance is a function of the, the number of nodes you have along one of the, over one, the, the length of one of the dimension plus the, the number of nodes you have over the length of the other dimension. Right, and if you plot that, and actually this is just a plot of, of, of this here, where my, my bands are a plot of this, um, and, and then you can look at the, at the relative energy 
of Ds as a function of the relative length versus width, and it matches, obviously, uh, what, uh, uh, what we are uh, seeing, okay? Um, turns out, you know, Maxwell's equations are right, okay? And, and, and all of these resonance equations are right. Um, We've been uh, increasingly interested in, in different shapes, of course. So the, these are basically the, the folded hexagons. So this is one of the sets of the twinning plane, but you can twin along another set that gives you these kites uh, uh, shapes with, with much more pronounced uh, um, uh, uh, sort of tips. And we've been interested in looking at, at what modes these would have, right? So here's a, an example, okay? I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. It just displays uh, another set of mode. Um, and, and, and we've, you know, looked in the literature and, and some papers, well, not one paper from the, from the 70s basically reports some field uh, uh, structures without, without saying much about them, uh, but we've also looked at uh, uh, sort of numerically how these would, how these would resonate uh, and basically to understand what the effect of the, of the filling and the effect of the folding angle is on these truly three-dimensional structures. So here's a an example of the effect of the angle. So this is all numerical, well, this is not yields. Um, we hope to, well, would like to get yields, but, but obviously some of the, the geometry of excitation is not necessarily possible. Um, but anyway, so, so if you look at, at, at a tan versus a taco, right, what's happening is that your angle is really squeezing in and, and, and your, your field intensity in that concave region is really, really, really increasing and your average field intensity uh, is increasing as well. And, and the same goes with basically uh, for kites, right? So, so here I have a, a very open kite, not a lot of field intensity here, a very closed kite, lots and lots of field intensity here. So that has serious implications uh, to do surface enhanced spectroscopy in a variety of applications of, um, of, of these structures. Uh, if we zoom out a bit and we look at these particles in, um, in the far field, again, they have color, right? And we can characterize that color to understand similarly to what we did with, with, with stem eels to, to look at the, the size and the shape uh, effects. Turns out these particles are really still pretty heterogeneous despite being so, sort of color. So we tend to do single particle spectroscopy. Uh, the way we do that is a single particle dark field scattering. This is an ancient technique. Um, it works like charm though. You're basically sending in uh, a, a cone, a hollow cone of light, and, and you're just collecting the, the light that's scattered and you're, you're uh, rejecting the light that, that is transmitted. And what you get is a, is a picture with little blobs, um, the diffraction limited spots. You, um, you can detect uh, these, okay? Um, we've built a number of setups, nothing um, that, no. That un unusual here, so we do we do uh, lots of hyperspectral in that, and what we do is basically push broom hyperspectral. Why? Right? So we're sending uh, this light to our spectrometer. We have a slit here, and we're recording an X position as a function of wavelength, and then we're building our data cube by basically scanning um, our image uh, in push broom, building our three-dimensional data set. Okay, this is this is really pretty uh, pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit over the next slide, but we can do this in a variety of configurations. We wrote a paper about this uh, as I, I, was, I was leaving the rise, can do dark field scattering transmittance and so on. We used to have that, when I was at rise, we wrote that in lab view. <laughs> Good joke, right? <laughs> Everyone's, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. So we moved all of that to Python in 2019 <laughs> and, and we're very happy now, okay? Uh, turns out, lab view. Mm. Okay, uh, and, 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 and with that, what you get is really a lot of statistics, okay? You can't take a thousand stemials data set, but you can totally take it. Well, Brian's like, yes, I can. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> That's the, um, um, but, but, but you can totally take a thousand uh, scattering spectra from nanoparticle and sort of correlate them with their, their, their size and shape. And, and it's noisy data because these particles are a little bit oxidized and it's hard to see. And, um, in um, in SCM, but but you get kind of kind of the gist, uh, and obviously you can do um, a polarization in this uh, as well, and and sort of point out to you know what. Um, what, what is an elongated structure versus what's not an elongated structure? We, I don't have data to show you on magnesium, but we've done this with, with, silver, with silver gold rods, and everyone has done this with silver gold rods. Right? We did not, did not invent uh, this at all. Um, but um, sort of 
I guess, semi-recently, um, we've been thinking about other ways we could, we could do this. And obviously, you, you all know that these modes and, and, and the, the push broom stuff is, is this here. You're building your data sets at one, one slice at a time. And we've been working with, um, uh, with Kevin Kelly, who's, I think, in the, in the Zoom audience and who's going to be talking uh, later at a different workshop than this one, um, how about how, how to build a, a dark field, sort of compress sensing uh, microscopes. And, and obviously, we, we don't want the 2D result. We want the 3D result. So what you do is that you're, you're going to spectrally structure your illumination, use a 2D detector, and then basically get a, get a 3D result um, uh, uh, out of that. Uh, we've been um, using a, a digital micro mirror to structure our uh, well, to, to structure our spectral illumination. Uh, obviously, you could use a, a raster and, and you, you calibrate that way by just using one wavelength at a time. Um, but really, in compressed sensing, what, and I'm sure we've talked a lot about compressed sensing already, right, Brian? Don't need to introduce that. OK. Um, um, and uh, you know, we, we use a, an Atomar, uh, basically, a, a matrix. Uh, here's the setup. It's very, very, very simple, OK? But it, it costs a, a tenth of, of what the push broom setup. Uh, costs okay, so so you're basically here seeing our light in the in, in our DMD, and we're going to come back right to to a focusing lens um, a, a, to a diffraction grating back here, uh, and then we're going into our dark field condenser. Um, that's kind of the tricky part, really, is just put the dark field condenser there uh, uh, into our objective and into a, a, a cheap CMOS camera, and and then we see basically our. Um, our, our particle scattering. And, and, and the beauty of this really is that, is that we can now acquire stuff, you know, one kind of two orders of magnitude quicker uh, and actually look at dynamic processes. And that, that's really the goal here, right? If you're doing push broom, well, you better have a really slow process <laughs> to look at it. Uh, but, but in compressed sensing, you can actually look at, 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 at dynamic processes. And, and we are interested a lot in, uh, in these with, with magnesium. Um, my student, George, has, um, you know, uh, uh, has played with this setup a bit, OK? So, so here are some, some spectra. It doesn't really matter. He's looked at, at the effect of noise, right? So where, which, which knob should you turn? Which knob should you not turn? Uh, uh, but, but, but basically, uh, you know, it's a bit of a, as you all know, um, of, a, of, a, of, a, well, of a finding the balance uh, between, between basically a, a sort of bit depth and dynamic range, um, and and we've we've worked on that. We we have a short paper on that, but really the the big results are are, are by Kevin, and, and he's got a, a recent paper in JFISCMC, basically on on a much bigger version of this setup that he has uh, in his lab. And so, if you want to know more about that, um, well, we can talk later. But but also uh, look at that paper. Okay. So how long do I have, Colin? Like, uh, you've got a lot of time. A lot of time. See. Or sorry, uh, uh, 13 minutes. 13 minutes. Jeez, I spoke too fast. Uh, but no, that's excellent. We'll, we'll be able to go to lunch. Okay. Um, the, the the last bit I want to talk about will not take 13 minutes. So that that's excellent. Um, uh, we're basically um, telling you about some of our really um, sort of more algorithm-based uh, uh, projects uh, that we do. And so this is, a, this is a joint graduate student that's just about to graduate. He's got a, a, an amazingly posh and you know, well-funded uh, um, sort of position now in a you know, sort of machine learning you know, place in Cambridge. Uh, and so he's graduating in December. Uh, he's joined with me and, and Paul Migley. And, and so, um, so we became interested basically in um, in, in, well, I've always been interested in how nano, nanoscale uh, uh, structure affects properties, right? And, and so we've been interested in, in sort of magnetism. And, and obviously, at the nanoscale, magnetism behaves quite differently. And, and so in Paul's group, they, they look a lot at, at skirmions. I'm interested in vortex state for some uh, sort of, you know, fo well, not quite phototermal, but magnetothermal applications, I guess. And, um, and then our good collaborator, who's also sort of pitching in with advising George, is, uh, is Rich Harrison. And he's, included, he's interested in sort of small magnetic inclusion that tell you something about, about the history of the universe, OK? Um, essentially, <laughs> a smiling to our science. Uh, OK, um, nothing to do with the universe. We're able to synthesize these structures, OK? They're magnetized. Um, Magnetite ish. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's not get to uh, you know. uh, nano rings. Okay. This is, this is synthetic. Um, 
and um, and we're just we're, we're just interested in seeing how how can you form different uh, different magnetic states uh, in these and, and what will these look like? Okay, so so here here are the rings. They're about 50, 60 nanometer uh, across. Um, okay, they are made out of iron and oxygen. Okay, as as expected. Okay, here's here's my DADS map. Uh, and, and then we started looking, okay, well, so we can, we can actually simulate this, this micromagnetic simulation, you just initiate and then you see how all the little arrows end up, you know, being, being stable. Um, and and, and we, ha we have a lot more of these diagrams that I didn't want to, to, to bore you with all of those. Um, but, but anyway, so, so what we do here is that we're going to look at, 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 at rings of different eccentricities and of different thicknesses. Okay, so, so this is just a sort of a perfect ring and then a sort of more sort of eccentric ring and, and, and so on and different thicknesses and, and we're interested in after we've, we've initialized this, this simulation, how does, w what magnetic state do they end it and they can either end in a vortex state which is interesting because that actually uh, means the particles don't have an external magnetization and they don't, they don't actually uh, clump together. They can form this weird sort of onion state which is sort of in between uh, or they can form a good old single domain state that you expect for really small particles. And so, so you can map that and make kind of a phase diagram, right, of, um, of these. And, and, you know, obviously, if the, if the particle is really small, obviously, uh, all you get is sort of, sort of a single domain. And if the particle is really, really thin, again, all you get is a single domain. And sort of somewhere here, uh, you, get, you get basically a, a vortex state. And we published this uh, maybe two years ago. Okay. Um, we then went back, okay, uh, to, to our uh, experimental data and asked ourselves, well, are our experimental ones, uh, you know, what do they look like in terms of, of, of these parameters? And then we kind of wanted to, to figure out what would they look like in magnetism. We never got there. But um, we have simulations, okay? And, and so we did, uh, we did some electron tomography on those, found a few interesting shapes, okay? So here, here's three examples uh, of shapes and ask ourselves, well, if, the, if these were ideal shapes, right, the ideal thickness and so on, where would they lie in our, in our phase diagram and they, they would lie here and, and, and you'd expect them to be single domain, but then when you run the micromagnetic simulation with the actual tomographic imperfect shape, uh, what you find is that they're, they're not all single domain, okay, so this one's this ideally single domain, uh, but this one definitely is, 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 a, is a vortex state, despite uh, the fact that if, if it were to be ideal, it, it, you know, it wouldn't be. And, and so, so we you know, just sort of looked at how these particles go from their initialized state uh, to, to, to basically the vortex state and look at what is the, the high energy transition state. And it turns out if you have like a bunch of kinks and you're actually kind of a tin um, uh, structure, your transition state is actually really quite, I'm sorry, the, the contrast doesn't, um, but, but your, your transition state is actually really quite low energy, so you can pass into the vortex state uh, easily, whereas if you, if you don't have these kind of imperfection, uh, you're not helped, uh, really. Um, and, 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 you know, we further scratched our head on that and, and asked ourselves, well, how can we quantify this imperfection and the health stuff distance and is a, is a great uh, way to do that, okay? And, and so you can basically put a number on how non-circular or, you know, non-ring-like uh, these, these structures are, okay? So you can go from ide uh, your ideal toroid to to your year real particle and have a number for this. And what I'm doing here is that I'm going to be plotting that number in my, in my uh, x-axis here and look at the, the actual magnetization or the, the, the stray field and, and different things like that. And, um, and, and, and basically, you find that you know, for some things, the, those imperfections um, uh, matter a lot, like you know, what state will they end up in. Uh, but for, for others, it, it's actually not, um, not that bad. So if you look, one thing we're actually worried about is this, this inter-particle magnetization, uh, right? And that's what, well, that's what I said, right? If, if you have a, a vortex state, actually there's no inter-particle magnetization until they're very, very close together. And, and that's actually true, that's the blue particle, the other one have huge interparticle magnetization. Um, but, but, but in the blue particle, whether you're, you know, nearly perfect, if you're really perfect, uh, or, or, um, or, or, or really imperfect, uh, well, it doesn't matter that much, so we might be a little bit tolerant uh, to, these, um, to these imperfections. Um, the last bit of thing I want to talk about, that's really George 
Um, George's brainchild uh, has been just an amazing student, and um, you know we never really got to to take um, to take data on these on these nano rings, and he you know he still doesn't have any magnetic data really, uh, but he's been really interested in doing sort of tomography of magnetism, right? And 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 tomography of magnetism is hard because this is vector tomography, <laughs> and and not only is it vector tomography. But 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 it's vector tomography from a projected you know, <laughs> from a projected image in which you know you, you sort of normally just acquire data with you know, maybe two tilt series if you're a real patient, um, but 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 then really um, you know you, you get you get your your B component from an X tilt your Y component yeah five minutes okay your Y component from a from, from a Y tilt you're throwing away all your other data. And, and then you're saying, ah, oh, well, uh, I'll, I'll find my, my z from that. And um, it's really quite lossy in terms of, uh, of use of data. Um, so, so, so what George has, uh, has um, done, and, and, and we're basically about to, to submit this, um, is, is to think about basically a multi-axis uh, scheme. So that's always good, right? <laughs> Uh, experimentally, just you know, yeah. lots of fun, right? Uh, okay, so so if you do do a multi-axis scheme, uh, you you can actually uh, find and reconstruct uh, basically your potential and turn that in, into your B field, and and um, and that actually helps uh, a, 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 a tremendous lot. And um, I'm not going to talk about this regularization because. Now, I, you know, that, that's Paul's brainchild, uh, but I'm going to talk about two of the improvements um, um, that I contributed to them. And, and one of them is basically the idea of not doing just uh, a, a straightforward tilt series, but, but actually uh, looking at a variety of, of tilts. And, and you can, you know, we, we, we tested uh, a number of these numerically. Uh, and instead of doing just you know a single x, single y, or, or just uh, the good old duo, well, you could do all sorts of algorithms, right? You can do a quadruple, a synchronizer, a conical, or just just sort of random. And um, and and you can quantify how how well these do, and you can quantify that in scalar tomography. And I have a graph that that's not on my slide, but uh, but you can quantify that also in in sort of vector tomography uh, performance. And 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 what you find is, is, is this is basically the in, Goodness of the reconstruction of, 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 of B along X, Y, and, and Z. Obviously, Z is you know, never as good. Uh, but, but the conical approach is, is basically your best bet because you are just sampling um, you know, a, lot, a, lot, a lot more in, in all the possible uh, projection um, uh, direction. Okay? And, and, and again, I, I'm not going to talk about this wavelet uh, regularization. OK, so I think I'm you know, basically on time. <laughs> Three minutes to spare, uh, so so I'm going to spend two minutes sort of summarizing. Okay, so 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 what we've seen right is that um, plasmonics are interesting to me anyway. Uh, the magnesium is 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 a is a good plasmonic that has a, a number of, of excellent uh, uh, attributes. Uh, we've looked at the different shapes of magnesium, looking at how we can look at twinning. Uh, we then got interested in twinning in, in body centered cubic, body centered tetragonal. Um, and I and I did claim that you know we are interested in finding body centered cubic materials to look at their twinning. Um, we then went back and look at, at a lot of stem eels that we do on these structures. This is really the key to understanding what kind of shape, what kind of modes there are there. You can't get that from the, from the far field. So the near field is really your friend in, in finding that. Um, but hey, we're also interested in the far field because in, in reality, this is how we are actually exciting uh, our structures. And I showed you a few of, 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 the, of the experimental setups. Uh, that we use to 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 do this far field didn't go too far in the the detail of the uh, of the actual data, but hey, uh, and 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 then we uh, we finished by talking about some tomography uh, reconstruction, and and I'm just going to end there and uh, take any questions you might have. <laughs>